All right, line V1, learning task 11. We're still continuing to look at breaking methods, and now we're going to take a look at what is referred to as dynamic breaking. And dynamic breaking is where we are going to go and take any type of a motor, squirrel cage induction, wound rotor, synchronous motor, and we are going to go and turn it into a generator. And then we are going to go and take that uh, generator and we're going to go and dissipate its power somehow through either external resistance, which we would do in the case of a wound rotor motor, or through internal resistance, which we're going to do in the case of, you know, synchronous and uh, through some of our squirrel cage induction, etc. We're just going to dissipate it into the windings themselves. But let's just go through what exactly dynamic braking itself actually is. Let's start by going and creating just a north and a south pole. And we need to go and establish this first before we can go and figure out how we are going to go and, you know, kind of cause this motor to, to break. So if we have a north and a south pole, we know a couple of things about it. We know that we are going to go and have current that is going to go and flow across in this direction, north to south. And if I know that my north to my south pole is moving the way that the poles move, you know how the poles move, around the stator of a AC induction motor, right? We've seen the poles moving their way around the outside, whether that's gonna be off of our three phase or whether that's gonna be done artificially off of our single phase to these uh, caps, etc. But we know that we are going to go and have a field that's gonna be moving around the outside, which means that if we've got a conductor inside of that field, let's go with this conductor right over here and right over here, we know that if the field is moving past the conductor in that direction, it's the same as if the conductor were moving through the field in this direction. So at the instant of startup, we know that the field's moving around like that, therefore the conductor is seen as moving like that. And if we go and use our left hand rule, start with your finger gun, stick your first finger across in the direction of flux, stick your thumb down in the direction of thrust, you would see that the current that you would be inducing into here is going to be heading in and on the opposite side over here where your thrust is going to be going in the opposite direction right we're rotating this thing around about a central axis first finger in the direction of flux thumb in the direction of thrust you would see that that current would be coming back out towards you this is how we go and establish motor action because now at this point what we'll be able to do is we can go around that conductor i'm just going to erase these here a second around that conductor and we can go and establish those circulating currents that are going to go around like that and on this one over here that are going to go around like this over here okay so we have got our two circulating types of currents so if we take a look at the way that a motor is going to go and operate we know that that is going to go and twist through is going to get caught by that one pulled around goes through like that and so we see that the thrust is going to be going in the same direction that the magnetic field is moving once again you can go and use your right hand rule keep your thumb folded in use your center finger in the direction of current going through your conductor either one first finger in the direction of flux you're going to go and see that your thrust is going to line up with these green arrows that i have over here that's how we go and get motor action great so now that we've got motor action Motor action is where we are going to go and take these conductors and we are going to go and induce a current. We're going to go and cause it to rotate around. But now, what would happen if we were to go and freeze this north and this south pole? Just prevent them from running all together. Well, at that point, what we really need to go and examine is the fact that my fields are frozen. So I'm just going to go ahead and highlight this over here and here, say that that's frozen. Uh, which means that we don't have this rotation anymore, but what we do still have on the system, and this is really, really critical to understanding it, is we have still got coasting motion, where we are going to be moving through in these directions. These currents that are inside of here were induced by my field that was chasing this thing around before. Uh, now I'm still coasting in that direction, but I'm going to go and have different induced currents. I'm just going to erase that whole center set up over here, and we are going to go and take a look at the way that we have got induced currents. I'm just going to draw these ones just a little bit bigger over here. So our coasting means that these conductors are moving through in these directions, which if I go and draw thrust like that, I can also go and correspond that with my flux that is going to be going through like this. Use your left hand rule to go and establish which direction your current is going to be going through. Keep that middle finger folded in, thumb in the direction of thrust, first finger in the direction of field, and you would see that now, because I've held this, I've frozen this field down, I'm going to have current heading towards me on this side, and I'm going to have current that is going to be heading away from me on the opposite side. 
What does that do? Well, what that is going to do is it's going to create its own circulating current around each one of these. Let's draw that circulating current. Once again, using your left-hand rule, left-hand rule means that this one over here, left-hand rule for conductors, is going to have lines that are going around like that. Left-hand rule on this one means that its lines are going to be going around like this, which means that now when I interface them with these lines over here, I'm going to see that I'm now bending that line up and down like that. Then this one heads across, gets caught, bent around like that. And so what I see is that the new thrust is now going opposite to what my old thrust was. Remember this red one over here, this is just inertia that we're seeing over here, inertia. That's the red one over here. This, because we've now frozen these fields in place, we've put DC to these fields and frozen them in place, then we are going to go and have motor action that is going to try to reverse this thing over here. And the beautiful thing about dynamic braking is that as long as we go and provide that DC to it, it's not going to go into reverse. It's impossible for us to go into reverse because this field is going to go and be stationary. And really, once we break this thing to a stop, I get the green counteracting my red of my inertia. Uh, then I'm no longer going to go and have any sort of a movement, right? E.g is equal to BLV. There's not going to be any sort of velocity between those two, therefore we would no longer have any movement. So that's, in a nutshell, what we're going to be doing with all of this dynamic braking. Now we've got a bunch of different dynamic brakings, but ultimately we are going to go and reverse the thrust that we have on the conductors. Okay. Let's jump through to our very first one. The very first one we have is dynamic braking of a squirrel cage induction motor couple of things that we need to go and isolate. Uh, we need to isolate how far power gets through into our motor itself. We're going to go and do that right now through all of these. Uh, we'll just leave those ones down there because they will continue through later on. We're going to go through here and through to here. So that's as far as power is normally going to go through here. When we go and close in, so we have power that's oops sorry I should carry that power all the way through the stop up to the start and to the M over here when we go and press our start button we are going to go and provide power through to the M coil my DB that stands for dynamic braking coil is going to go and be initially closed we haven't provided power to it yet my overloads are going to be closed so we're going to go and seal in my M my M is going to go and close in like that which means it's also going to go and close in all of these over here so let's go and follow that through. So this is going to go and close in over here, it seals itself in. It's also going to go and provide power through to the motor itself. So here's my motor power that is being taken in here at this point. Great, we have got operation. Do note that that motor power can't go any further out along these dynamic braking lines over here because it's going to be blocked by that DB that we have over there. What we will do is we will go and run our motor now for an indefinite amount of time. At some point, we're going to go and hit our stop. And when we hit our stop, you should see that our stop is a double pull type of device, which means that when I go and break this contact, then I'm going to go and make a contact across the bottom. And this is really critical to us that this thing is going to make a contact because that is going to allow us to apply our braking. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go and hit my stop over here. When I hit my stop, that is going to interrupt everything that was downstream from here. So all of this is going to go and open. All of these end contacts over here are going to go and open up as well. So I'm going to go and have all my M's that are going to be opened up. I'm going to go and have a power that is going to be now applied through here, through this, which is a normally closed time to open up to this timing relay and to this dynamic braking coil over here. The instant that I apply power to that timing relay, it is going to go and seal in. It's got an instantaneous contact over there, which means that it's going to go and seal in up to there. So I can take my finger back off that switch. It's also going to go and begin its timing at that point. So we're going to go and have the timing itself that's going to tick, 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 start its timing, and that's going to be associated with this one over here. That all happened the instant that I press that button. The other thing that happened is all of my DBs are going to have closed in now at this point, which means that I'm going to go and have power I can feed off of my lines. Let's go and follow this through. I'm going to be able to feed, take power into this. This is a bridge rectifier, and I'm going to be able to go and pass that power out, same as I'm going to be able to go and take power in here 
and pass that power out. If you take a look at your bridge rectifier, you should note that this side over here is only going to pass positives. So this is going to be my positive. This side over here is only going to pass negatives. That's going to be my negative over there. And so what I'm going to have applied to my motor is I'm going to have a negative applied to one of my phases. I'm going to go and have a positive that is going to be applied to my other two phases over here. We'll just follow those through. Here's my positive being applied in to those two. And here is my negative being applied into this one over here. What that does now is that puts a fixed field onto my rotor. We just looked at that at the very beginning of this, where we examined what happens when we go and freeze the rotating field, and we still have got inertia that is happening on my actual rotor. That inertia is going to go and continue to run the rotor, but as the inertia is pushing in that direction, I'm going to go and get my dynamic braking that is going to be pushing back in the other direction. It's going to be really smooth as well because the dynamic braking, the amount of force that my dynamic braking puts out is going to be directly related to the speed, right? EG is equal to K by N or B L B. Either one of these tells you that the value of volts that I'm going to go and generate on my rotor is going to be based upon speed that I'm going to go and see. And as this thing slows down, I'm going to have less speed. Therefore, I'm going to have less volts. Therefore, I'm going to have less current. It's going to be a really smooth type of um, installation. Where's all that current going? Well, that current is going to be acting as a short circuit inside of the rotor. Don't worry, that's fine. Our rotor bars are designed for that. That's how the motor normally operates is that we have got current that is going to be flying through those rotor bars. They're big and sturdy. They're going to be made out of, you know, cast or cord, aluminum or large copper bars, etc. This dynamic braking that we see over here on our squirrel cage induction motor is going to go and dissipate all of its heat off the rotor. It's the rotor that is going to go and heat up for it. Perfect. That is it for our squirrel cage induction motor. Let's go move on to the next one. The next one that we are going to have is going to go and be my wound rotor motor. Now you should remember things about your wound rotor motor. I hope you remember. It's only been a couple of days. Please tell me that you do. Uh, but the wound rotor motor, as you well know, is going to be a motor that is going to be accelerated through the use of resistance. It gives us that really, really good uh, high torque type of output there where we can start, you know, ridiculously heavy loads by keeping resistance in there. And ultimately what's going to be happening is as we're going through, we're going to be shorting out and shorting out as we're going through, which is going to go and take out my different um, resistor banks, which really just allows this motor to come all the way up to speed. They can be used as variable speed, but we don't generally use these things as a variable speed type of component. We've got much better ones for that. They're generally used as a heavy torque type of component. Once again, you'll note that this thing is going to be a modified drawing of what we saw before for our dynamic braking. If we go through on our dynamic braking over here, um, we can follow all of our power through up to where it goes into you know, our, uh, our components over here. We see that's coming off the line there and off the line over there. So we're just going to follow this one through. It comes up to here, 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 and then through that normally closed stop up to my starts. And at that point, we have got this system primed and ready to go. I also note that I'm going to go and have power that is going to be fed from there into here and from there into here. We're going to go and provide a constant uh, voltage into this bridge rectifier. The bridge rectifier is not going to go and dissipate any power. If I take a look at it, this one over here is going to go and pass through any positives, making this my positive lead. This over here is going to pass through any negatives, making that one my negative lead. But there's no current that's flowing through there, so I don't have any sort of dissipation. That is going to be happening off of it. Okay, let's go and press our start button. When we press our start button, I'm going to go through this one fairly quickly because it's theory that we've covered before on the startup. When we press our start button, we are going to go and provide power through the normally closed dynamic braking uh, contact through up to my M coil, which is going to go and seal itself in. And it's also going to energize the TD1 and the TD3 coils that we are going to have over there. So let's start by bringing power over to my M coil. And let's just go and quickly run through here and see what that all changes. As soon as we power up the M, 
This one is going to become open, preventing us from passing any current through. We go down here, we see that these three over here are going to be closed, which means that we are now going to be providing mains power through to my motor. My motor is going to start up and run. These contacts over here, S1 and S2, have not been made yet, so they're going to be fine. They're just going to be left outside of the circuit, and all of my rotor current at this point is going to be traveling through all of my resistance that I have on that system. At the same time as I start up my M coil, I also start up TD1 and I started up TD3. So if I follow those ones through, I'm just going to go and look for TD1 and for my TD3. I note that my TD3 is a normally open time to open, which means that this thing would have to be an off delay type. This one over here, TD1, is going to be a normally open time to close, NOTC. Uh, therefore, it's going to be an on delay type. It is really critical that we recognize these symbols for what they are because they are going to go and tell us about the instantaneous operation of these things. This one here is the NOTO that we have. Okay, so going back into these ones here, let's just quickly see what they were doing uh, since we provided power. This one over here, time delay one, began its timing, whereas this one over here, TD3, would have instantaneously gone and closed, which would have been doing absolutely nothing. We see it's isolated on either side by a set of dry contacts here and another set of dry contacts over here. So it's not doing anything for the time being. So right now, we're just in first stage acceleration is really all that it means. At the end of the timing on the first one over here, TD1, TD1 is going to go and close, and as soon as it closes, it is going to go and provide power to S1. When S1 closes, S1 is going to go and close out over here, which is going to go and drop the amount of resistance that we have. And so right now, we're only going to be going through these resistances over here on my motor rotor. So we're going to have taken out some of that resistance inside of there. S1 at the same time as it's dropping the rotor resistance is going to go and close in over here, which is going to go and provide power to my TD2. And if I take a look at TD2, it is a normally open time to close as well, NOTC. So it's going to be an on delay timer. So this one's going to start its timing, tick, 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 tick. At the end of its timing, it is also going to go and close. And when it goes and closes, it is going to go and provide power through to my S2. And when it provides power to my S2, it is going to short out the last batch of resistors that I have on my rotor circuit over here. Okay, so now we have got the rotor circuit completely shorted out and we've got everything running right now. The motor is going to be up to speed, delivering full values of torque that I'm going to go and have. We see that everything else inside of this circuit is now, um, it's, it's got nothing else, no other timing or anything that we're waiting for. This top timer over here, the normally open time to open, isn't going to do anything until we go and turn off our main power so we don't have to worry about it. These are all open. We haven't hit the dynamic uh, braking contact yet, so everything will just kind of run now indefinitely. At some point, once we get all the way uh, to the point where we need to go and break, we're going to go and press stop. When we press stop, we are going to go and kill all of my M contacts and my TD contacts, but then simultaneously, we are going to go and put power through into this bar over here. Let's go ahead and do that. We're going to go and press stop, so I'm going to go and kill that leave that power bar there, but I'm going to go and kill my M coil over here and my TD3, or sorry, TD1 coil. So TD1 is going to go and drop out at the same time as TD1 is going to go and drop out. It is going to go and drop out S1 over here, which is going to drop out TD2. TD2 is going to go and drop out, but by action of me pushing this, this stays closed right now because this is now starting its timing because we're in an off type of concept configuration here right now. As I press this all the way down, it is going to go and make contact with this down here. Oops, sorry, I forgot one other thing. It's killed this motor set of contacts down here as well. My rotor would still be turning. We're going to go and have inertia right now that is going to be running that rotor. So we'll just draw an arrow over there for inertia. Uh, 
As soon as I finish pressing, so the stop kills all of this other stuff, but then I press it all the way down to the bottom, and when I press it to the bottom, it is going to be providing power now through up to here. Now my M coil shut off, so it's back to its default state. This is still held by its timer, so I'm going to go and have power that is going to get passed through to my DB, and as soon as I do that, DB is going to go and fire in all of its components. And its components are going to go and be these ones over here. So we see that it is going to go and seal itself in, even when I take my finger off of that stop push button, it is going to go and stay sealed in. It is also going to go and seal in S2, which is going to go and keep my rotor shorted at this point. And it is also going to close in these, so I'm now going to be applying a positive onto these rotor windings, and I'm going to be applying a negative onto this, uh, sorry, not rotor stator winding. So I'm going to have a fixed field that has now been placed onto my stator. I've still got inertia, therefore this rotor is still whipping around, but this rotor is now going to be in a short-circuited configuration because these S2s are tied together, which means that it is gonna allow for maximum current flow, which means that it is going to go and have maximum amount of braking. The rotor is going to be dissipating any of the heat inside of itself. Once again, we're just allowing maximum amount of current to go and flow through those rotor windings and we're gonna dissipate all of our heat through there. It's going to continue to go and run until the point where we um, are this thing times out. It is tied to this off delay at some point. That off delay is going to finish its timing. When it does that, it opens up, kicks out my DB, my dynamic braking, uh, which is going to go and open up all of these over here and drop that out as well. And we're back down to our default state and ready for our next startup on that motor. It's a bit more complicated, but it's not, uh, you know, crazy, crazy complicated. It's still going to be the same, you know, step, 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 where we are going to be going and firing on the motor. And then we're going to be taking S1, S2 to go and bring it up to speed. And then we go and take them back out while we apply DC onto the stator in order to go and break this thing down. Last one that we have to go and take a look at is going to go and be our, uh, oh, sorry, no, not the last one, second last one. We do have another one over here with a wound rotor motor that's going to be less to do with time because this one here is all based off of time. And if I got a high inertia load, it could still be running by the time that this thing times out. Uh, this is going to be more to do with my frequency and it's when I'm using frequency sensing relays to go and bring this thing up to speed. You'll note that I've got a couple of relays over here that are going to be listed with frequencies off of them. We do know that anytime that we create our rotor, or sorry, our synchronous field on the stator, our rotor is also going to go and generate a field based upon how fast it's being lapped. The, fat, the more that the rotor is being lapped by the stator field, the higher that value of frequency. So in other words, at startup, I'm going to have a higher frequency that's going to be inside of my rotor, and later on it's going to go and start slowing down and dropping out. We'll see that applied through all of these over here. Once again, we'll carry our power through. We're going to go and carry power up to all of these over here, which shows that we have got power now just sitting and waiting. And we're also going to go and carry power through to here, as well as we're going to take power off of here, which once again, this is going to be passing a positive through there. So this is going to become my positive rung. This is going to become my negative rung. But they're all isolated off of the fact that we've got that dynamic braking contactor sitting on them. Let's go and press our start button. When we press our start button, we're going to go and provide power through. It's going to travel through my normally closed contacts. It's going to energize M, which is going to go and seal in anything that has got to do with M. Anything that's M will change states, as we see here, 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 and here. So at the instant of startup, we apply this. We're going to go and seal in all the way to the end of that rung. It just returns back. I'm not going to draw the bottom line over there. It's also going to go and provide power through, and I've got a set of contacts over here, 1F. And I see it's going to provide up to a 1A over here. That's also going to have a 1F that's going to be up to it as well. Uh, at the instant that I went and applied start over here, what I would have also seen is that the motor stator would have received power, which means that I would have had that synchronous field that's moving around at, we'll call this thing 1800 RPM based on the number of poles. It doesn't tell us. We're just going to go and pick a generic value. 
1800 RPM, but my rotor is going to be at zero RPM. Therefore, I'm going to go and have a maximum value of frequency that is going to be generated in this thing right now, which would mean that if I've got maximum value of frequency, I'm also going to be looking at maximum value of voltage. So this is going to be energized as well as this is going to go and be energized, which means that their sets of contacts inside of here are going to be sitting open right now. So that's as far as I've got my circuit started up here right now. So right now we're going into the acceleration stage, the very first stage that's going to go and happen. These are all open because these are all unpowered, etc. My motor is going to go and run. Now it's going to go and get up to the point where, you know, it's starting to move uh, at, you know, 5 RPM, 10 RPM, etc. As it builds speed, we know that our frequency, F of our rotor, is going to be dropping. And as it goes through its different frequencies, it's eventually going to drop out these over here. The first one that's going to drop out is this one. It needs 40 hertz to stay sealed in. As soon as we lose that 40 hertz, it is going to go and depower. And as soon as it depowers, that's going to go and allow this to return back to its default closed state, which is going to go and power up 1A. And 1A is then going to go and short out the first bank of resistors. So I'm going to go and have a shorter path for current for my rotor current over here. I have not been highlighting that one. I think we've covered that enough. You guys should be able to do that mentally. My rotor current is shorter at this point. It continues to go and uh, speed up. And as it continues to speed up, once again, we are seeing less and less value of voltage and frequency that we are seeing off of it, right? We're getting that attenuation. Eventually, we're no longer going to have 20 hertz off of here. And when we lose that 20 hertz off of here, then this one is going to drop out, which means that this is going to close in over here. This 1A, by the way, had closed that one, which means that this would have powered up my 2A. So now 2A is also going to go and close. That's going to go and short out the very last of my rotor resistance. And now my wound rotor motor is going to be operating at full proper synchronous speed. Wonderful. We'll let this thing go and run now for an indeterminate amount of time. And at some point when we decide that we want to go and shut it down, we're going to have to go and hit our stop. So let's just examine everything that we've got up top here right now. Let's press our stop. The first thing that happens is it moves away from this. And as it moves away from that, it is going to drop out my M coil. So we're going to move off of there. It's going to drop out my M coil. That means that anything that's M is going to go back to its original state. This one's going to go and open. These ones over here are all going to go and depower. When these ones go and depower, all of these over here are going to, for a brief instant, pop open over here. And so right now we're just in the middle of this transition. We're just pressed the stop. We came away from that set of contacts, but then almost instantly as we're pressing that, we make contact with this, which is now going to go and apply power to my dynamic brake, which is then going to seal this and which is going to go and close these in. As soon as we close these in, we're going to be applying DC. Oops, my M all dropped out. We'll start applying my DC to my motor. So now I've got a set fixed field that my motor is actually spinning inside, right? We still have that inertia that's going. Because it is spinning inside that now we've got maximum distance. We've got a stationary field over here and we've got a rotor that is moving somewhere near that 1800 RPM. Therefore, as a result, we're going to be back to seeing maximum values of frequency off of here. So right now we're going to go and see maximum values of frequency, which means that these are going to be sitting popped open over here right now. I do have power that is pushed through all the way up to here, but it's just going to go and say, oops, sorry, this one here is only up to that section over there. It's only going to stay this far. Now, as I am breaking this dynamic break, I'm getting that countering fact that's going against my inertia, the dB that is fighting against the I, my inertia over here. I'm going to slow down and all of a sudden I'm no longer going to be at 40 hertz over here. That's going to be the first one that's going to go and drop out, which is then going to go and drop this out. I'm then going to go and apply 1A, which is then going to go and short this one out over here. And then it is going to, in turn, as we continue to slow down, drop this one out. And then eventually we are going to go and pass through all the way here to my 2A. And in doing so, this is going to, as my frequency, as my speed goes down, 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 
I'm going to be putting resistance back back in. Remember, this is just the opposite of the way that this thing started up. When we had low speed, when we were building speed, we started with putting resistance in. We went from zero with maximum resistance to maximum speed with no resistance. Now we're going from maximum speed with no resistance back down to zero speed with maximum resistance. What this is going to do is we are just going to go and have a really good power factor. We're going to go and have a smooth uh, deceleration. We're also going to go and get a lot of good deceleration torque. You should remember this formula. Torque is equal to K phi I rotor multiplied by my cos theta. And because we're putting this back in every time as we're dropping these down, we're shorting these in uh, or taking these ones out, we are going to go and keep ourselves at a maximum value of torque for these. Okay, that is our wound rotor motor. We've got one more big motor diagram to go through, and that's now going to be my synchronous motor controller with dynamic braking on it. Now, this one you'll note is different in that we don't need to have a bridge rectifier. We've already got DC that we have uh, got on here. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to go, and at some point when we're braking this thing, we're going to go and take out these, lock those out, we're going to put these in, which is going to go and put resistance across my rotor. It's going to be the same as if you refer back to alternators when we had a revolving field alternator. That's all we're going to do is we're going to have a revolving feed field alternator or generator and the prime mover for this is just going to be my inertia, my centrifugal force that had this thing running, which means that as this thing breaks, as it slows down, we're going to go and see bogging, that this thing is going to be pushing back against that. Let's go through our operation off of this one. Once again, it's going to be very similar to what we saw before. Uh, we are going to go and have just a modified control circuit for this. So I'm going to go and carry power through up to these, up to these, up to these over here. And then I'm going to also on my DC side over here, carry uh, through up into my components there. So we're going to take these ones over here. Here's my DC, here's my DC. And then here is my DC going through over here. That's as far as we need to go and take this right now. Uh, for the rest, it's you know sitting at rest right now. As soon as we go and press our start button, we are going to go and start accelerating this thing. So we'll press our start button. That is going to go and fire in CR1. It has the out of step relay. We're not going to go through that. That's just a you know timer over here. That's going to make sure we're not taking too long to accelerate. But we've got the CR1 that is going to get powered up and it's going to go and close in. And when CR1 powers up, it is also going to go and close in here, which is going to run my M and my TD. So let's just go and do that. CR1 is going to go and power up there. When CR1 goes and powers up, it's also going to go and close this, which means that I'm going to go and have power applied through my M, which means that this over here is going to go and have closure over there, which means that we are now sealed in. We can drop that top part off of our start push button over there. Uh, that M has gone and closed in. We've also gone and powered up my TD1 over here, which is, if we take a look at this thing, NOTO. It's an off delay type that we have. M closes in. When M closes in over there, it is also going to go and open this one up. This one over here is going to be sitting closed like that. It doesn't matter. We don't have anything applied through to the rest of the circuit right now. That's going to be good to go. My M is also going to go and close in all of these, as well as it's going to go and close in all of these over here. And so at the instant that all of that is going to go and happen, when we close in these lines, we apply my mains power to my stator. And as soon as I apply that mains power to my stator, the stator is going to go and create a synchronous field that's going to start whipping around the outside. My rotor is going to be at a, value at a standstill at zero, which means that it is going to go and have maximum value of voltage and frequency that's going to be induced inside of it. And so if we go and follow that one down, we would see that we're going to have that maximum AC that is going to be running through my polarized field relay and back up to my field like that. We're going to go and have acceleration that's going to go and start. My rotor is going to go and begin to accelerate. Uh, it's going to be picked up by those amortisseur windings. As it goes and accelerates, it's going to get faster and faster and faster. And as it gets faster and faster and faster, that AC that we had on there is going to go and attenuate. Once again, it's going to drop its value of magnitude and it's going to lengthen its wavelength. The frequency is going to be going down as well. 
Eventually, we're going to get to the point during this acceleration that this is going to be at close, you know, 95, 92, 97, somewhere in that range, where we're going to be close to our synchronous speed, whatever the synchronous speed is. And when that happens, this PFR is going to drop out. And when the PFR goes and drops out, sorry, this one should have been open there when PFR was energized there before. When this PFR drops out, it drops this back into its normally closed position. And boom, my field contactor is going to fire in. When the field contactor fires in, it closes these, it opens these over here, and it is going to go and apply full proper DC that is going to go up to my field. It's going to go through that reactor because that reactor acts as a short circuit over here. So that's going to be my startup. Now, now I've got this thing operational. It's running at full synchronous speed. Uh, which means that I'm not inducing anything more inside of my uh, mortise here winding or inside of my field or anything like that. We'll just go and run this thing for an indetermined amount of time. And then at some point, we are going to go and press our stop. When we press our stop, we're going to have a couple of things that happen simultaneously. Let's begin by just interrupting our path of current flow in the control circuit over here. So we're going to go and take out our stop, which is going to go and take out my CR1. And when I take out my CR1, it's going to go and take out my M, my main contactor. So we're going to start by just making this open over here as we're pressing down on that button. Take that out, which we lose all of those contacts. We lose all of those contacts at that point. And then this one over here is going to go back to being open. This one over here goes back to being closed. So for a brief second, this happens at the same time as that happens, we're going to go and get my time delay that is going to start to run now at this point as my time delay starts to go and run uh it's going to start its time we also had our m contact that is going to have kicked out over there and my m contacts that are going to have kicked out over here so for just a brief second as my fingers pressing down from here and bringing it all the way to here we're going to go and have an open all of this as soon as i have an open all of that my field contactor is just going to go and kick out so we're going to go and lose synchronization for just a brief second over here and as we lose synchronization this is going to kick back in immediately we are going to go and have a path through this field like that so we're going to have a little bit of resistance and this rotor is going to just begin to slow down just a tiny bit now this is all happening over top of a brief brief second we have this that then finally makes contact. So we're pressing our stop, we broke the top, we saw all this other stuff shut off. Now we make contact with this down here on the bottom. When we make contact with that on the bottom, we are now going to provide power to my dynamic braking contact. When I provide power to my dynamic braking contact, that is going to go and open these over here, close these over here, close all of these over here. And it is going to go and close this over here. So what it's going to do, in essence, is it is going to go and put in resistance. It's going to put in a load. Pretend this is a three-phase generator. We've now applied a three-phase load onto this thing. And at the same time, it is going to go and reapply the field contactor over here, which is then going to, and this is going to open over here, which is then going to go and apply my DC back to my field. And at this point, it's just going to act as if it were a rotating field alternator and with a load on it and we are going to go and see this thing that is going to be generating because it's got that inertia already on it it is going to go and be generating voltage eg is equal to blv or k phi n whichever one you want to go and work with it's going to be generating a value of voltage that voltage is going to be placed over top of these resistors which are connected in y over top of it and it is going to go and therefore send out current, which allows us to go and break this thing down. This one is different than all the others that we've looked at so far. All the other ones we were dissipating uh, using our dynamic braking, we were dissipating all of our heat across the rotor circuit. This one over here, we are going to be dissipating our heat externally across these resistors that we have over here. They're not going to be rated for continuous duty. They're uh, going to be, once again, you know, intermittent duty that we are going to go and have off. That covers over the end of our dynamic braking. Uh, talk about advantages. The advantage of these ones is we cannot accidentally reverse the motor. 
At worst, we're just going to go and have DC that is going to go and be applied to our winding. It's going to cause some heat, but it's never going to cause reversing. It is going to go and give us, because we see that every single time, the amount of generated voltage, which is going to give us our generated current, which is going to give us our braking force. Because it comes off of the speed, it is going to be speed dependent. So it's going to go and give us a smooth positive retardation. In other words, a smooth slowing that we are going to go and have off of it. We're also able to adjust how quickly this thing breaks by adjusting the amount of DC that we send out. We've got a field rheostat here that we can go and send out. We've got a field rheostat that on this one is right over here. So we can adjust how much DC we inject into it. And we've got another one on this one right over here so that we can once again control the amount of DC that I put into it. I put more DC into it, I'm going to get faster braking. I take a little bit less, I'm going to have slower braking so I can adjust that. And we don't have any extra friction parts. There is still friction parts. If I take a look at a synchronous motor, a wound rotor motor, both of these do have brushes and slip rings, but those are brushes and slip rings that are there for the necessary initial operation. This isn't anything extra that we're adding in. Disadvantages are the fact that we do need an extra bit of DC. Now on some of them, like my wound rotor motor, that's going to be me adding in an extra bridge rectifier. We see that off of off of these ones over here. But on others, like my synchronous, I've already got the DC, so there's not a lot that we're adding in to this one. We also don't get braking if the voltage would fail. If I don't have any DC to go and put into here, if I don't have any AC to rectify into DC to go and send into here, I'm not going to get any braking. So on a power failure, the motor's just going to coast to a stop. And I don't hold the motor in place. Once the motor has come to a stop, there's nothing that's going to lock it in place. Last of all, if I do have too frequent of stopping, we can go and get motor overheating, particularly on the wound rotor and on the squirrel cage induction because they have to go and dissipate all that energy across the rotor circuit during the braking action. Okay, that covers dynamic braking. We've only got a little bit more to go through on the rest of our braking. That's just going to be our regenerative and eddy current sound.